Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us uh, for this talk shop. We are really excited to have David Joyner speaking with us today about sense of place, about writing with a sense of place, incorporating that sense of place uh, into your writing. So David, it, he, we're talking about literary writing here. David writes novels, we're talking about fiction, but uh, I think that a lot of what's said here might be applicable to people writing in, in other genres as well. So David, good morning. Welcome. Thanks for being here with us. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Let me start off with a very brief and inadequate introduction just by saying that David, now we know he's a novelist. We know he's a writer. He's got a background, educationally speaking, in Japanese studies, in writing as well. I think you've done an, an MFA in writing. Was that right? Yes, that's yeah. right. Yes. And then the other big point is he's lived in, he's from the U.S., but he's lived in Japan and Vietnam off and on, back and forth for pretty much his entire adult life. I get the sense that you move more than you stay somewhere <laughs> looking at all the places you've lived yeah, um, yeah still haven't recovered from all the moves our last one was from the U.S. in uh, 2022 but I think we're here to stay now I hope <laughs> and here is Kanazawa here is Kanazawa right. so I have a tiny little brief slide show consisting of two slides to share just to look at his books to orient us. We have the, the, the Vietnam collection first. We have Lotus Land and Stray Cat City. And you can see the years there in the publishers, 2015 to 2016. And then we have Kanazawa uh, last year in 2022. And I think we're just on the, the verge of release. It may already have been released in some areas. I, I'm not sure, but the Heron Catchers. So these are from Stonebridge Press. And Peter, thanks for being with us today. Um, we, we may have things to talk about with the, the publishing in the world, but these are David's novel titles and we've got the gist there uh, of the books and you may have taken some notes on things to look for if you don't already own copies of these. Now, actually, I do have one more slide. And since we're talking about getting the sense of place and setting into the works, and that's something that people who talk about David's work always remark upon about how he's got this really remarkable sense of place. He's got vivid descriptions. The reader really feels like they're immersed in the place where the action is taking place. David, I hope you don't mind if I share this. I, I pulled a quote from your website from an old interview. It was an interview about Lotus Land. So these are your words, but they're words from long ago. Okay. But I think this really wraps it up. So here we have, I have a tendency to write imagistically. And to use setting like drapery, not to obfuscate the reader's vision, but to hang it as close as possible before their mind's eye, so that it not only see it, but feel surrounded by it. That's the hope anyway. So I, I don't know if you still agree with this, right? The things we say long ago, sometimes we wish they, they weren't there, but to my mind, I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah, no, that sounds like it still applies. All right. So the next step, I think, in just giving us a sense of what exactly we're talking about with David's writing and this sense of place and, and how it comes across on the page. So we've asked, and David has agreed to read something for us. Now, the thing that you're going to read is from, is this right? You're actually the first novel, but the not yet published novel. Is that right? That's right. This is a novel, novel I've been working on off and on for about 20 years. And I really want to get back to it at some point soon, but it'll probably have to wait until... I am finished with the third sort of Kanazawa novel that I'm trying to write. So maybe in a few years, I'll get back to it. But it, it started long ago, and it's changed many times. But I'm happy to read a, a, a short passage from it, so I can set it up if you'd like. Uh, yes, yes, please. Go ahead. Okay. So the scene that I'm going to read is it's set in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam in the early 1990s. And the woman in the scene, Cerise, and although I generally steer clear from writing from a woman's perspective, this is the exception. In this novel, there are uh, two different POV characters, but she's a river dolphin researcher. And the scene is setting heavy, which is to say that it's very descriptive. But it does more than merely describe. In the, the first sentence, in the final paragraph that I'll read, the scene has progressed to a sort of authorial statement about my aesthetic for the entire novel. 
And in that final sentence, it also shows Cerise's attitude towards this place where she's alone for several weeks and is working on her own. And it also hints at a conflict that she's on the cusp of having to deal with. Here in this scene from, uh, from the opening chapter, she's on a small rickety motorized boat traveling from her research station on a tributary of the Mekong River to a local market. So again, this is from chapter one of Burning Green Sun, uh, midway through the chapter. Cerise soon reached the main stream and the sounds of the motor flattened out. The trees on the opposite shore were of uniform height, a dark green wall through which light neither penetrated nor escaped. The main stream was nearly half a mile wide. In the windless morning, its surface was undisturbed, but for clusters of water hyacinth floating downstream and schools of fish plucking the surface with their mouths. Along the river were boats often much larger than hers, weather-beaten barges, packet boats, cargo junks, with worn tires like chains around their sides, eyes painted on their bows, and small light blue crosses hammered atop their wooden roofs. After she arrived at the market and tied her boat to a landing, she walked toward a nearby loading area, trying not to impede a line of shirtless men weighted with goods. When a break appeared among them, she made her way toward the market entrance, beyond which it was equally crowded. The stalls went four rows deep. She paused beneath a giant ficus tree as a succession of motorbikes pulled into the market's crowded parking area. From behind, a motorbike's horn buzzed. She let pass a driver transporting ducks, dozens of them strung together and hanging from every imaginable part of the vehicle. Several heads thumped her leg and she felt a twisting inside her stomach. The birds at the back were stained black on the pipe side of the motorbike, and she saw that their contact with her leg didn't make them so much as blink or open their bills. They weren't dead. A few near the bottom flapped their wings when they hit the ground and began to drag, but they seemed to know they were on their way. Precisely for the resignation she perceived in their small pebbly eyes, the ducks became something pitiable. The market wasn't an ugly place, nor a dangerous place, but a place where poverty and dirt combined to form a kind of beauty. It was a beauty all the more striking for its, its appearance in improbable places. The things that held no beauty in America frequently captivated her in Vietnam, and for those things that were wholly alien, they captivated her even more. A restaurant's flooded courtyard in which cockroaches clung to safety on the floating bodies of dead rats, giant moths thudding into the yellow bulbs of streetlights and the smaller geckos scurrying up the poles to eat them. The roasted heads of teeth-bearing dogs lined up in the markets she visited after they'd arrived in Hanoi. The variety of shapes and colors and roadside fruit stands and the limbless beggars ho hovering nearby. Crumbling cham ruins, which she'd seen from the window of their Saigon-bound train. Brick kilns dotting the countryside like the giant termite cathedrals of northern Australia. The verdant rice paddies, the patterns formed in their tall shoots by wind. The mud-slogging water buffaloes and malnourished children who rode their backs. The stick-figured old women who bore yokes on their shoulders and humped through the watery green. It was a beauty she couldn't give words to, but felt deeply, undeniably like pain. I this was this novel many years ago was with an agent who was considering signing me to a contract. But she said after reading the book that she felt like she desperately needed to take a shower afterward. And she meant that as a compliment. And I took it as such because she felt that she'd been transported successfully to the Mekong Delta, as I saw it in the early 1990s. And that's important to me. One of the things that I really want my readers to experience is, is a feeling of, of immersion in the places that I describe. So there you have it. <laughs> Thank you, David. That was powerful. <laughs> and and I, I think that it is, um, a perfect example of this immersive experience that, that we're getting at. We're talking with, with what you do so well with setting. So yeah. writing about the places where you lived and the, the places that, that you know pretty well, but they're also not your native places. Is there a connection there? So is there a connection between where I grew up, where I was raised and... Oh. Or of, of being somewhere that's not familiar and how yeah. that impacts writing mm -hmm. and the, these descriptions and I guess your authorial point of view or, or the way a painter learns to paint by dissecting light and what's happening with really where's white and dark in it. 
and doing that same kind of thing with with writing with realizing what you're seeing and how to put it out there on the page yeah i think there are a few things that come into play actually i think for all of us who write about a place that we're at one time or another we're completely unfamiliar with when i first arrived in japan in 1991 as an exchange student then three years later when i arrived in vietnam as a volunteer teacher I've probably never been so observant of the world around me as I was in, in those two times. And just my world opened up just entirely coming from Ohio and never really having left the United States until I was 21 and went to Japan. It was just a real shock to my system, a wonderful shock. I mean, it was very pleasant to be in Japan. And But just to see how different everything was. And I had an even stronger reaction when I was in Vietnam, because that was in 1994. And the country was really struggling. And I was living in the countryside. And it was just the complete opposite of, of anything that I had experienced before. Not having electricity, not having running water some of the times, and, and things like that. And the heat the food, just everything was so different. The way the people behaved in certain situations and things like that. I just became hyper observant at a young age. And I think that those were some very formative times for me. And I think that undoubtedly those times in my life continue to be reflected in my writing. I, I don't know really how to explain that. And um. I'm not sure really how to continue from there. <laughs> yeah, I don't really know how to answer that question. I thought that I did. No, I'm just I think of... you did. You did. You did. <laughs> I think that's the key point, or that's the first place to start is this being observant, becoming observant. Now, for, for most of us here in, in this particular audience, I think we, we are like you, like your characters, where somewhere that's not our native land, or we have that experience behind us, and or we are dealing with what we write, it's similar. It's not our native environment that, that we're describing. I should also add that when I write about Vietnam, especially 20 years ago, when it, people still weren't all that familiar with it, it's tourism has really taken off in the last 20 years. Um, and there's not maybe such a need for me to go into such great detail to describe places. But in the case of Kanazawa uh, or Yamanaka Onsen, where most of the heron catchers is set, I do feel a responsibility to explain places to readers who I don't expect to be familiar with those settings. So that's part of it too, is, is that I feel like I really need to include a lot of detail to bring the place to life, to world build enough that readers are not going to ask questions about it. You know, what exactly is this place like? He's talking about it, but I don't really see it. I don't really smell it. I don't hear it, whatever. Um, so I am, I'm very conscious of the need to do that. And maybe I do it too much, but what I cut from first draft to final revision, the majority of it is probably setting. I enjoy writing it. For me, it's what comes easiest anyway. So let's talk about that if we can for a minute, that editing process. Are there any specific things that you think about or do you have rules for yourself? How do you know what to cut? Is it just simply gut feeling or do you have some guidelines? What, what, just tell us what that process is like for you. I may not even have the right specific question to answer. So, so what's that like for you? I think it's largely instinctive. You have to balance everything in your mind. When you've got a, a manuscript that's from 250 to 350 pages, <clears throat> it's a lot to keep organized in your head. And you've got it on the page, but it's not the same thing because your mind is constantly working on, is the balance correct? That kind of thing. Am I paying too much attention to this? Am I not paying enough attention to that? And I think my editing process differs in some ways for each book. When I talk about balance in Kanazawa, I remember there were different threads in the story, different sort of sub stories. And I remember going through at one point and copying and pasting all of the text from one sub story and then doing the same thing for another and then just looking at the word count for each one and reading through them all 
just to see if they read smoothly or if reading through each sub story, if I found that there was a gap in the information that I took for granted, what I had in my head, maybe wasn't on the page. And if I send my book to friends for some feedback, they'll often say, you're talking about this, but you haven't explained this. Where did this come from? And I think, oh yeah, I had it in my head. I forgot to include that part. <clears throat> so for me, when I have a structure like that, <clears throat> and, and the same is true of dialogue. Sometimes I'll just cut and paste dialogue and I'll just read it all the way through in a scene and <clears throat> make sure that it all reads smoothly, that there's nothing extraneous in it, that, that I haven't left anything out. I, I've done that before with my books, but largely a lot of it is just simple matters of diction and things like that, just tinkering. There's a lot of that. And I am pretty ruthless, though, when it comes to cutting things. If there's a whole chapter that I think doesn't work, I don't hesitate to cut that chapter. I'll put it in a separate document and I'll save it if I change my mind later, or if I want to take something from that chapter and use it elsewhere in the novel. But I spend most of my time revising. With the heron catchers, as I've saw, said elsewhere, it only took me 26 days to write 260 pages. So it was about a chapter a day, about 10 pages a day, um, which doesn't seem that difficult a task, really. Okay, 10 pages a day, a chapter a day. I've never experienced that except that one time. Like I said, I've been working on one book for 20 years, and another book took me 26 days to write a first draft of. But I spent another year after that revising the book. And so if you compare that first draft with the final draft, they're quite different in a lot of ways. For me, it's just important for my draft to have a beginning, a middle, and, and an end. And any gaps or inconsistencies that I find in revision, that's where the book comes together. And that's where the craft comes in, I think. Um, in the beginning, you just want to be open and receptive to whatever ideas are flowing through you, you in that moment. And I do like to work with outlines in the beginning, short, very short outlines, like a page single space for the whole book. But then I have to revise that outline as the book continues to grow and, and change. But the editing process is the most time consuming for me. It's also the most pleasurable because the book is gradually coming together and, and it builds confidence and it just, it gels. It becomes a much clearer story in, in my head. And it's something that I look more and more forward to sharing with people as I, as I progress in that. So what you said about taking, for example, different subplots and pulling those out and comparing them and the dialogue, that sounds like an excellent plan. I think maybe some writers aspiring writers have, have cribbed notes from that. Do you do that with setting as well, with what you've said about how you describe a place? You mean? Making a sub, off. yeah, pulling things out and seeing, have I said this or how have I described it that way? I haven't. From your facial expression, no, but. <laughs> I was trying to remember if I had or not. And it wouldn't surprise me if I had, but probably I haven't. I don't necessarily feel a need to do that. I don't worry about the setting as much as I worry about the subplots hanging together or the dialogue feeling right. I guess I'm more confident with setting or the setting. My characters go to enough different places that I don't feel like I'm working with just one place. It's multiple places that make up a larger, the, the world building that I'm doing. So I, I don't think I've done that, but I don't see any reason why one wouldn't. I just haven't felt the need to. Yeah. So hearing you speak about how you're crafting this, how you're putting it together, how you're tweaking it, how you're refining it, how it's gelling, that makes me think of some of the things I've heard frequently when listening to, to interviews or when seeing interviews of your work is that, I guess the, the couple of terms that come out, one is the Japanese sensibility. Now I'll just put that word out there and say that we're not saying that there's only one Japanese sensibility, and we're not saying that there is a Japanese sensibility, but this thing that we're perceiving as a, a Japanese sensibility. And also, people are throwing out the director, Ozu Yasujiro, saying that your work has a very Ozu feel to it. And from what I've read and hearing those comments, my interpretation of that is the rhythm and the pacing. It's the things are fairly the slow, they're calm, they're peaceful. 
the descriptions and inside the story itself, the way the characters are dealing with themselves, everything is very tame. It's very careful. And I think that's one of the things that's coming out. And then I have a part two to that, but I'll wait. I'll let you respond first before I go to my part two. What do you think about this Japanese sensibility? Yeah. I I don't always understand the comments that people make about my writing. For example, they say that my setting is well done or something like that. I, I don't think it's any better done than anyone else's setting, but maybe I'm just so used to the way that I write it. Nothing strikes me as being necessarily different from what anyone else is doing out there. But, and the same is true with regard to this, the sense of Japanese-ness about the novel, a Japanese sensibility. It is true that I read a lot of Japanese fiction in translation. And there's no doubt that those novels and short stories that have influenced my writing to a degree. And I also, I think one one aspect of it, maybe, I don't know, I'm just throwing this out there, but that I try to weave into my stories elements of, of Japanese culture and give them significance to my characters' lives, to their worlds, to their lives. And Kawabata does this often, even though he was Japanese and he was writing for a Japanese audience. But think of the tea ceremony and Shino and Karatsu wear in Thousand Cranes, how he brings that into his stories, or of the geisha culture, Shijimi cloth, mountain life in snow country. There are cultural elements that he brings to bear on the stories and on the characters. And maybe in some way, I'm trying to do something like that. I'm not consciously copying him in that way, but I do wonder if that bringing, for example, Kutaniyaki or Basho into the Heron Catchers, that sort of thing, the origami cranes, what have you. And in Kanazawa, there are a lot of sort of cultural elements that I bring from this part of Japan. I bring those to into the story as well. So maybe that adds to the sense of a sort of Japanese-ness about the story. I don't know. But I think also that when you write a book, a novel, you always have in the back of your mind other books that you're aspiring to equal in, in terms of the quality of the writing, the quality of the stories. And again, I'm not saying that other books that I'm trying to copy from them or anything like that, but I do think they're in the back of my mind. I want to write a book that's equal to these other books. And there are certain books, certain authors that I aspire to write books of the same quality. I don't think I'll ever get there in pretty much any of the cases, but you have to set the bar high, I think. And so I think that almost certainly... I would do this if I, I were writing in a specific genre like mystery writing or crime or romance. There's a certain sort of structure or template or whatever that you need to follow more in those than in literary fiction. But for me, I think the, the genre, whatever you would call it, is Japanese fiction in translation. It's what I read most of. And so it, it's what I have probably in my mind as I'm setting out to write a book and as I go through that whole process. So I don't know, maybe that helps explain it a little bit too. I, I'm winging it here. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. It was very enlightening. And so many of the things that you were talking about there with this sense of Japanese-ness or answering what's been said by your readers about this Japanese sensibility, it, it ties so directly into this sense of place because it's locating the, the reader in the, this physical space. Now, I just want to throw in a little disclaimer here that a lot of your work has been about Vietnam and we're talking specifically about Japan now. So I assume that the same thing applies to the, the works about Vietnam, which I'm not as familiar with. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned talking about adding in mentions of no, and you've got the cultural references. And I should say that they're the things like the pottery, the kutaniyaki, for example, it's, it's not just a passing reference. Your characters are actually people whose profession or avocation, at, at least, they're heavily involved in these things. So it's not just a, a little passing reference. Although there are, are also other small references to people will mention no or studying no or doing tea ceremony or something that just either little drop in kinds of things. So those have a significant 
presence, the, the cultural involvement uh, of your characters. It really is quite heavy. Oh, I do know something in Lotus Land, the protagonist love interest. Can she also be a protagonist? I'm not sure of her level, but she's a lacquer painter, this traditional lacquer painting in Vietnam. So that, that I do know that it extends beyond just the Japanese works. So talking about how mentioning some of those things gives a sense of the the setting. And, and you mentioned that Kawabata does the same thing. Even though he's a Japanese author, he'll throw in these things. So I think there's a fine balance here between the way someone from outside a culture, and I say that with some qualification because uh, you've been in Japan for so long and it's not, to, to what degree are you now outside or in your non-native culture? When someone's writing about their non-native culture, and writing for an audience who is also outside of that culture. I think this, this, this is a key point because as you, just as you were mentioning, you have to, to build this world that your reader's gonna be able to access and understand. And you're trying to color that world and you're throwing these things in. It, to my mind, having, for just calling to, to mind other things that I've read, it can be difficult to get that just exactly right. And I think this is something that you do well, because when you're throwing in things like that, they can feel exotic, or it can feel like the author is continually explaining something to the reader. But you weave these things in fairly seamlessly. They're not exotic side. They feel very natural. So that's something that you do well. I'm making a point there rather than asking a question, but I don't know if you have something to, to say to that. Yeah, there are times where I'm afraid that I'm explaining too much, that the author's hand, that I'm putting myself in the story too much and um, interfering in a way. But again, I think that a, a lot comes down to revision, where you just get a sense. It's it's instinctive how much needs to be there, and uh, also just the manner in which I'm presenting it. It's also to, nice to have um, uh, readers give you feedback. I don't have a lot of readers. Um, for my work, uh, Peter Goodman, my publisher at Stonebridge, um, he has given me excellent feedback and that's been really useful to give a final shape to uh, a lot of the novel, actually. The feedback is really important. I also have to be careful. Some Just because you receive feedback from one person doesn't mean that what that person says is right. You really have to have a pretty strong sense of what it is that, of sort of your vision for for the book and one's use of language and things like that. Yeah, it's nice to have in input from people, but I think it's also important to stick to your gun sometimes too. If your vision is one thing and you really believe in that, I think you really need to stick to that, I guess. I don't know if that answered your question or, or Yes. Not. I tend to forget yes. questions. <laughs> Thank you. Right. And well, in this case, there, there wasn't a question. I was prompting oh. you to, to say yeah. more about that. So that was just right on. So something that's connected to these sorts of examples are using specific words that you frequently include a lot of Japanese words. And, you, and of course, I don't know the extent to which Vietnamese words pop up in the other works, but in the Japanese ones, in Kanazawa and in the Heron Catchers, there's a pretty liberal use of Japanese, the, the words in italics. And that can be tricky. It, for one thing, it's one other way to bring to the reader's mind to remind them of the place that they're in, when, that, that they're in Japan, that they're in a certain setting, and to remind them of the physical space. So this is something in addition to a description of the physical space that gives this sense of place. So I think these words do a lot of heavy lifting in that respect, but that can be tricky when you first mention a word, you've got to explain it somehow. And this goes back to what I was uh, trying to point out before. It can be very heavy handed, um, but you do this well. And if I can bring up this Genkan example that we talked about the other day. So in Kanazawa, the, the word Genkan frequently appears. I think it, that's the case in the Heron Catchers as well. But the first time that it appears, oh, and I, before I say that, there's the one school of thought that you want to make an experience as seamless for the reader as possible. So as few Japanese words that are used would be a good idea. You could say entrance example instead of genkan. It doesn't quite capture the whole feeling, the right feeling. But then again, you're, if your reader doesn't quite know what a genkan is in the first place, then we've got that hurdle. So uh, let me just stop with the explaining and read what you did with that, because this is an, an excellent example. Please excuse us, Kimura said to her, and pulled Emmett into the genkan, where... 
Below the step leading into the house, everyone's shoes but Emmett's were neatly lined up. So you give us the word Genkan and you put it into a context so that we see what's happening. We see what kind of space we're talking about without saying Genkan, the entrance way, or the Genkan entrance way. So you, you did that so very nicely. So can I just ask you what your thoughts are in general about the Japanese words? And then secondary to that, how you deal with them or, or how you decide to deal with them is this easy. What would you like to tell us? What can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think the times that I include Japanese words, largely it's just based on instinct. Why did I choose this word, but not this other word? I'm not really sure. It just seemed right to me or because it comes up enough that that particular word in people's conversations. Do I want to say entrance way 20 times, or do I just want to use the Japanese word genkan? And there are two ways to go about it. You could put, just say genkan entrance way, right? Which is a bit redundant, but for people who, who understand the word genkan, but, and then you can just use the word genkan after that, whenever it comes up. You don't have to keep repeating on entrance way, gink on entrance way. But I prefer when I can to sort of embed the meaning around the word so that there is a context for it in the text. And it's fun to do that, I think, to figure out a way to explain a word without stopping to give a definition or something like that. It's just, it just flows out as naturally as you can make it happen. In there's not a single instance in, I think, any of my books where I don't take for granted that this is a foreign word that some readers aren't necessarily going to recognize. And so in, in every case, I always try to um, create some kind of embedded description of it. Um, but it, it doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes I cut that out and I go with Genkan entranceway or something like that just because it's more efficient, for example. or But I do like to include some of these foreign words in my works, because like you said, I think it does add uh, a sort of flavor of Japan. It reminds the reader of where they are. And so I think it can be useful in that way. Yeah, but I've seen it done both ways. I've seen it done in many different ways, actually, in other people's writing. Some people just don't explain it at all. They just let the words appear on the page as they are. And if the reader wants to look them up, you've got Google, right? And I understand that. But if I can, when I include the word in my story, I'd like to have a description of it that just flows. So the reader doesn't even realize that here I am giving a definition of the word. And you mentioned references to literature fairly often. And I, I think that the way you handle those frequently, it goes in along with the same thing. And Mentioning Japanese literature within Japanese literature, that again gives this sense of place, of setting, and it locates the reader within the Japanese literary tradition as well. Mm. And that's deliberate. I just, I like Japanese literature so much, and I want to share it with readers. And the area where I live in has a strong literary history. And most people don't know that. Even Japanese people I speak to about the local literary history are often not aware of it at all. It's something that I like to include in my books because I think it's important. I want to share it with people. So it's not merely because it works within the the context of the story, but it's something that I want to put that in there. So I find a way to put the, that in a lot of the time. Yeah, I, I think it's working. I think it's fairly seamless. I'll give everyone a little preview small snippet from the herring catchers about the, the Basho uh, mention. So the characters are, I think they're at uh, Ryokan at the moment. And Sej is the protagonist. Just read this little bit. Sej had read Matsuo Basho's The Narrow Road to the Deep North. So we knew that centuries ago, the haiku master had passed from Kanazawa South into Kaga and stayed in Yamanaka Onsen. Basho had strolled along the Daishoji River, somewhere below the window of his room writing poems about the exceptional water of the town's hot springs, whose scent he compared to chrysanthemums and which he suggested would bring longevity. All over town were old stone kuhi monuments celebrating his visit uh, and the haiku he wrote during his stay. So that, that does a lot of different things there, uh, so, some of which you've just mentioned, and it just gives an illustration to those points. 
but you bring in the literature itself, you're explaining the physical location, the place, you're letting the reference to literature explain the setting where the character is right now and talking about the town and talking about these monuments. So in, I guess it's in Yamanaka Onsen where the Basho, Basho monuments are in this instance. Yeah, yeah, and I then, think they're, mm, they're not only in Yamanaka Onsen, but there, oh, right, are, but there are like 13 or 15 of them all around the town. So I think there's a tourist map for people who want to locate them. They can walk through the town to find each kuhi and that kind of thing. But that's an example too of where I use kuhi in the book a number of different times, but it's just so much easier to say than stone stone monument with a basho. <laughs> it's more efficient and I just prefer. It's having... got a better flavor. <laughs> yeah, there you go, yeah. Now, there are also monuments in Kanazawa that the characters go and visit a lot to Kyoka. And so that's part of the story. Mm. And right. now, is this intentional, a, a, a part of Kanazawa that you wanted to introduce to readers? There, there are those monuments that I also talk about, uh, the many sort of statues that appear all over the city, too. And none of those are made up. Those are all real statues. And the monuments to Kyoka that I talk about are all real monuments. But, you know, that's a way of, again, bringing that sort of literary history more into the story and trying to help readers visualize the city more, the setting where the story takes place. And these things exist in the city and they're there. I, I, I feel that they're there for me to exploit. <laughs> they're there for me to include in my writing if I want to. And so there's some that I didn't include, but I did try to include as many as I could, because I think that gives the story, the setting, a bit more authenticity. And if people do find themselves in Kanazawa at some point, they could easily find these places after reading my book. And in fact, um, Peter Goodman put a, a, a map at the front of the book with the location of, of all these monuments, these Kyoka monuments and some of the, and the statues and things like that. So again, if anyone visits Kanazawa and wants to find any of these places that I mentioned, they're all there on a map in the book. Yeah. Yeah, that was an excellent place. Thank you, Peter, <laughs> for that. <laughs> I, I really love it when that kind of thing happens, when there is something visual to, to let me as a reader really get my bearing and, and see what's happening and see where these people were. So let me go backtrack a moment. Uh, let me stay with this point and, and connect it to another one. So we're talking about visiting places in, in the town and some monuments. Um, and I'm going to go back to the Japanese sensibility and the being Ozu-like. And in addition to the slow pace, the lack of a big crisis, the, and that kind of thing, is these small changes in people's lives that are this sort of hallmark of Ozu and, and perhaps Kawabata as well. But in terms of Ozu's cinematography, he uses this term pillow shot. I don't remember if the people who have talked about Ozu and your writing have mentioned that specifically, but when he switches from one scene to a drastically different place, um, he, the scene will frequently open where the camera is just still for several seconds, a much longer period than we're used to these days and in modern cinematography. But we just see the spot uh, and there's some landmark and it orients the, the reader to, to where we, we've gotten. And he uses pillow shots in different ways other than that, but that's one of the main ones. And I, I think there's a great example um, of that in Kanazawa. They, the characters, I think they've been looking at some monuments. They, they've been to a lake, they're driving somewhere. And they, they've left, and there's a section break in the novel, the kind of thing with a couple of asterisks, and then we have a new section. And then it begins with what's very much like an Ozu pillow shot. They, they've come to a museum, so I, I'll just, where it starts. The museum entrance was reached via a short walking bridge in a hexagonal structure patterned after a snow crystal. Beside it, a canal lined with cherry trees extended to Lake Shibayama. Despite the sea's proximity, the image of Haksam beyond the lake's placid waters drew their attention. It rose like another world, its upper half still frozen, its long ridges still draped with snow. And then we get dialogue. Would you like to come in with us or head off on your own? So it's, it's exactly like an Ozu pillow shot. And we have this section break, we have the setting, and then boom, someone starts speaking. We have the, the, the characters enter right there. So this may, may or not have been something that anyone pinpointed, but I, I think that's 
part of what makes it feel, your works feel like an Ozu film. Yeah. Well, thank you for mentioning that, for using that uh, particular scene. I've actually been told that's maybe a bad tick of mine as a writer, that I often <laughs> start scenes with the pillow shot or whatever, the describing the setting and then moving from there to the action or to the dialogue or something like that, instead of varying my approach from one scene to another. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It may be a tick, but I don't know that it's a bad thing necessarily. I think that if I can vary the way that I open, close one scene and open another scene, that's all the better. But it just may be my style of doing things. And it's not something that I consciously set out to do. It's just a tick. It's just my sort of instinct, I think. I think often when I stop something and my mind's blank, okay, where do I go next? There's usually an, an image that comes to mind. Okay, we go from there to here. Here is this place. Let's put it down on paper and then go from there. And so I don't know how imagistic my writing is compared to other writers out there, but I do rely on imagery quite a lot and maybe in ways that I shouldn't so much. But again, it's just an instinct. I don't really give that a second thought a lot of times. If it seems to work with me for me, then I keep it. I go with it. Mm. Yeah, my personal two cents here, my two yen would be that it's just a different style. If someone criticizes that it doesn't feel right, it's because they're used to something else. Just like Ozu in his time was, was groundbreaking. And it's not what we're used to now, but it has its own beauty and its own rhythm and its own flow, its own integrity. Mm. So it, it, just, it is what it is. Yeah. And I think often when you write setting, whether you realize it or not, you're capturing a mood, you're projecting a mood, and you're developing the atmosphere to that scene, or you're building on what has come before. So I think it is, setting can do a lot more than just describe a place or a time. Yeah, and I think that's one of the nice things about writing setting and, and revising it is that you get to try to make it work on a deeper level. It's not something that has to take weeks to do. I think it normally comes of its own volition. The novels do tend to write themselves in a lot of ways. And you just step aside. You're just a conduit of the, the story. And some of it's deliberate in revision, as it always is. But when I'm just putting things down on paper and just connecting one scene to another, or I transition from one chapter to another... I do think I tend to rely on images quite a lot, like the ones that you, the one that you read. Yeah, I, I, I think they work. I, I enjoy them. Thank you. And speaking of tying some things together, I don't know if this one point uh, is, has bearing or not, but snow is such a big theme in, uh, in Kanozawi. Open with this snowy scene. Uh, Haksan is there for, for my, um, the protagonists, the, the the two, the married couple, they're they're having a disagreement of of a very um, a very important sort about where they're going to live. And then at one point, they when they've just realized that they have very different views on things, and that it what's his name? I have to get my characters. The image is the protagonist, yes, in this one. So he thinks he hears the snow, but it feels like it's falling between the two of them, that kind of thing. So that, that scene had really made this snow impression on me, this coldness, this theme. So here we have the bridge, this hexa hexagonal structure pattern after a snow crystal. So whether that has any bearing or not, I, I have no idea. It may be simply describing the bridge itself in reality, but to me, having all of these, these mentions of snow, and then I see the snow, it, it, it triggers something. It makes me feel differently about the setting because it's connected to all of these other things. Hmm. Now, it feels not feel differently about the setting. It's not just a setting. It conveys something about mood or what's going to happen or the relationships between the characters. It, it's nothing concrete. It's just this vague hmm. thing that's going on. It colors the background a little bit hmm. in a very specific way. Hmm. It's nice to hear. All right, I have one final question to you before we stop for break. I see we've been going for just about an hour now, so this is, this is good timing. So you, you've mentioned uh, more in, in other interviews than in this one, but that some of your early reading has had an effect on your writing, or at least when you were starting out. And we're talking about the, just this everything we absorb 
goes into what I like to call the compost pile and it, it comes out. I'm curious, what are you reading these days? What's on, what's um, on your reading list now? <laughs> I don't use the Kindle very much, but I did just buy a, a copy of The Rainbow by Kawabata, who is my favorite author. And so I'm reading that now. And uh, I think I mentioned in an email that there was a Kindle sale recently on a number of Kawabata's novels. And I have them all in paperback. But I thought, oh, oh how convenient would it be would, to have them on my phone? I could just read them at any time on the bus or while I'm sitting on a bench or what, whatever, on an airplane, or I could read it on my laptop. So I have all those. And as I think I have said in other interviews, at the end of every year, I like to reread Kawabata. It cleanses my palate after the eclectic reading that I've done throughout the year up to that point. It is a reset for me. I'm reading this new novel that's out in English translation. I think it was released just a couple of weeks ago. And then I do plan to reread several Kawabata books. Again, perhaps on the airplane to the United States when I go back for the holidays. But I've also recently read Karen Hill Anton's A Thousand Graces, which I loved. I thought it was fantastic. So I may reread that soon. I'm not sure. And uh, Diane... Uh, I'm not sure if I have the name right, Nagatomo, her her book, The Butterfly Cafe, which was really good, very entertaining. Both books are set in Japan. Those are great. I am also reading Marie Mockets, where the Japanese pause and the dead say goodbye, I think is the title. It's a wonderful book. It's beautiful. And it's just such an interesting nonfiction work that really is stemmed from the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and the tsunami and the radiation situation and all of that. Does a deep dive into sort of Buddhism and things like that. It's very interesting. So that's what I'm reading now. I just bought a massive collection of short stories by Somerset Moham. I think it's like 800 pages, really small type. So that's going to take <laughs> me a really long time to get through. But I look forward to that because I'm a big fan of his writing. Excellent. Thank you very much. There may some, might be some recommendations for us in there. And um, now I will cede the floor and let everyone else have a chance to ask questions. I guess we'll take what's already been posted in the chat first, roughly in order. But be, before I get to the questions, let me just point out at the end of the chat, there's this clarification of the title of the book that David mentioned. Marie Mockett, the author. Oh, there we are. Where the Dead Pause and the Japanese Say Goodbye. Jeremy starts us off with a nuts and bolts question. Do you use any special software designed for fiction writers? And have you found any use for AI in the writing process? Uh, no, I just use Microsoft Word. That's all that I use. Um, I think I once many years ago bought, uh, I think it's called Scrivener or something like that. And it yeah, looked really Scrivener, cool, yeah. But it just was way too complicated for me. And I, I just didn't have the patience to learn all the tricks and the tools. So all I do is um, use Microsoft Word. Um, and uh, AI, I found no use for it. But for the uh, the novel that I'm writing now, I was researching some work by uh, Muro Saise, another Kanazawa writer. And, and I had bought a book in Japanese of essays and... I'm just so slow at, at reading Japanese that I just want the information quickly. So I used uh, the Google camera to translate it. And I took the, the Japanese text, put that into the AI. The GPT? Uh, GPT, yeah. And made sure that the sentences were actually all in the correct order. Because sometimes I find that Google kind of puts things all mixed up. <clears throat> and then I use that for translation just to get a gist of what he was saying. So just for research on Japanese materials, I have used that, but I don't use it for anything else. I try to avoid it as much as I can. It bothers me. I'm old school, it's a bit af afraid of the future, but anyway. Thanks. Jeremy, is that, are you satisfied? Is, is there anything else you wanted to tag on to that? He has the next question as well. Is all your work set in contemporary times or have you ventured into the past? 
It's all contemporary. <clears throat> the, the novel that set in Vietnam in the early 90s, I started writing that 20 years ago. So at the time, that was 10 years in the past, but it's now 30 years in the past. And I'm writing about river dolphins, and there are very few left now. By the time I finish that book, if I and if I ever get it published, they, they may have become extinct. I don't know. You know. Time goes very quickly. But no, I wouldn't say that I've written any historical novels. I'm not particularly confident that I could manage that, actually. It seems like a lot of work. <laughs> Jeremy, we see your mouth moving, but we don't hear you. No, I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you for your questions. All right, Cody, go ahead. Hi, Cody. Hi. I've shared a story by Kyoka with David this year, and David was an excellent editor of my translation. Yeah. And yeah. I really appreciate that. But it made me think of the theme of this conversation today. And thank you, Lisa, for such insightful questions. So the sense of place. The story that I shared with David is by Izumi Kyoka, and it's set in Fukugawa around the turn of the 19th, 20th century. And one of the things that really drew me into that story was his evocation of a sense of place, his description of a place and the people who live there. And it reminded me of an essay that Kyoka wrote in which he said that in the case of many of his stories, including the one that I translated, he started with the place and then he found the people who were living there. And my question is, David, do you find yourself doing that as well? Do you start with a kind of a general sense of the place that you want to evoke and then find the people who are living there? Or do you start with the people and then situate them in the place that you're interested in? How does that work creatively for you? That's a very good question. Yeah, actually, for me, it all starts, everything starts with setting. So I decide where I want the book to take place. And because I'm writing a series of novels that are set in this sort of general Kanazawa area, that always comes first. I always know that's what I want to do. And the characters present themselves to me somehow. I don't know how. It's just between thinking of the setting, where I want to have it, and then starting on my one-page outline of where I think things might go, I just hand it over to the creative process, and it all just comes out on its own. I don't choose the characters, really. I might go through a certain scenario, and the people just, I don't, I, it sounds silly to say, <laughs> oh, they here. But I don't give that a lot of thought. It's usually going to be a character who's probably much like myself in, in, in certain ways, an American male, middle-aged, or maybe a little younger, who has a certain yearning or a certain conflict that they are dealing with. <clears throat> and maybe I give a bit more thought about what I want to explore in a book thematically in terms of a, a conflict or something like that or what a character is really striving for and what they may be up against. But I don't have anyone's name. I don't have anyone's, what they look like. None of these things come to me in the beginning. Um, it always starts with setting and somehow characters, potential characters, uh, eventually the actual characters just ar arise. I, I don't know how to explain it really. Um, but what's, I find writing, and it's not only true of dialogue, but I'll use dialogue as an example. When you're walking down the street and there's no one else around you, and you just go through your head of a conversation that you had or that you wish you had, or a conversation where you wish you had said something else that had gone a different way, but that conversation might play out over a couple minutes or however long. And that's often how dialogue on the page, or even just the creative process works for me, where you, your mind just takes over and you don't think about the conversation that you're having in your head, this imaginary conversation. It just plays out. <clears throat> and that's largely how it goes 
for me. A lot of people are afraid of writing because they don't know where to begin. <clears throat> I'm thinking you probably are telling yourself stories and other people's stories all the time. And it's on the spot. A lot of people ask you to tell them something that happened to you or how did your day go? And you just tell it. It just, it comes together. It organizes itself. And even when it comes to choosing characters and things like that, for me, that's often how it goes. All I have to do is open a Word document. It's, it's this blank page. And I just start typing a little bit. And maybe I pause for as long as five minutes. But eventually, something comes up and I put it down. If it doesn't feel right, I'll delete it. And something else will present itself. And if it still doesn't work out, I'll go to it the next day. And my mind is coming from a different place. And so the results are, are going to be different. But I don't really think about it. I don't give a lot of thought about it in the beginning until I have an outline. And then I look at it and I said, does this work or not? Does this interest me enough to spend the next year or 20 years on? And whatever it happens to be. But yes, it all starts with setting because I know that I want to write stories that are set in Japan, that are set in the, Je the Kanazawa area, and again, that are set in Vietnam. And I particularly want to write about the Mekong Basin of Cambodia and, and Vietnam. Those places fascinate me, and I want to immerse myself in them. Um, mm. Writing can be a nice form of escapism. Yeah, so again, setting is important for that. But yeah, thank you for your question. I don't know if that answers it or not. It does in a way. I think setting is really important. And obviously, it's more important for some writers than for other writers. But but in terms of that creative process, it's an interesting one to begin with a setting and then find the people who live there, as it were. The other question I had was, what is your fascination for Japanese literature? Obviously, you're a great reader of modern Japanese literature. And uh, you like people like Kyoka and Kawabata. What is it about the style and sensibility of those authors that really captivates you? That's a good question. And after all these years, I don't really have a clear answer to that. I think, again, it speaks to me just on a personal level somehow. I do read these books in translation, though. So I'm not reading Kyoka's or Kawabata's in, in Japanese. I'm reading... Edward Seidenstecker, and it could be you, your translations of Kyoko, or it could be Charles Shiro Inoue's. And these are all really excellent translations, and they're so good that I'm reading them again and again a lot of the time, and I'm ga gaining something new from them every time that I read them. I think a lot of it has to do with language, and I, I find the translations, and I would probably find the Japanese, if I were to read the originals, to be very just beautifully written too. And that speaks to me on a very sort of deep level as, as poetry does, I think. These are very poetic sort of translations a lot of times. And I really appreciate that. I don't think that I'm a natural writer per se. And so when I do come across beautiful, I'll even say efficient, but beautiful writing where a lot is communicated indirectly. And a lot of, there's a lot of suggestion in the best Japanese literature, older Japanese literature, especially, that really fascinates me. It appeals to me, what's left unsaid, but it's still out there. That I'm just very attracted to that sort of way of storytelling. But also I just find, for example, with the case of uh, Kawabata and also of, of Kyoka, actually, it, it just immerses me in, in, a, in a different time, in a time that's gone and will never come back, that is, I'm a sucker for these romantic sort of portrayals of Japan at a certain time in history. And I've told people before, I, I, I got to Japan too late. I wish I had been born <laughs> earlier and had arrived in Japan earlier, because I think that the time before I was born was probably some of the most interesting period to experience Japan. I think it's a sort of an ongoing trope right. for... Westerners yeah. writing about Japan, we got yeah. here too late. I think so, but I do feel that. And uh, I think yeah. that an attractive quality of some of these writers from the past. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Benya, before we go to you, hang on just a minute. Jeremy has a 
question that's been waiting in the chat and it tells here. You may have answered that before, but the question is, do you have a preferred time span for the action in your novels? You were just talking about what you like to read and you before you talked about writing in roughly the contemporary period, but anything else to say on that? In my novel? Oh, but um, Jeremy might want to clarify. He's got his hand up. Sorry for these kind of mechanical type questions. But when I say time span, I'm not referring to a period to show hour later or whatever. Um, would the action in one of your novels ordinarily take place within a, a single week, within a month, within a year? Oh, that was what I was uh, curious about. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think most of my novels play out over the period of about a year or so, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems like a nice period of time to get a, a story down and let the conflicts play out and things like that. Mm -hmm. I've read novels that took place within 24 hours from start to finish and things like that. I I don't think I could do that. And it it's not something that I would probably even consider. Mm -hmm. um, again, I don't know how much time I spend thinking about that before I start writing a book. Usually the pace of the book decides itself. And I, I think my books tend to be pretty slow go going in the beginning, but a lot of that is just, I need time to set up a situation and then I need time to resolve that. And for some reason or another, I, I don't really know why, but all my books usually take about a year from the beginning of the story until the end of the story. And that's, I guess it's just a very comfortable time period for me to work in for my characters and and their situations but thank you that's so it's not a, a deliberate choice but it just not deliberate well. choice. Yeah. yeah but these shorter time spans like books that play out within a 24 hours or a week i deliberately avoid those but i don't deliberately choose this one year time span thank you that, yeah sure Jeremy, I'm sorry I misinterpreted your question. <laughs> sorry about that. All right, Svenja, now on to you. And is that the right way to pronounce your name? I apologize. Yeah, Svenja, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. It's a privilege to be able to ask a question. I'm so excited. I have a springboard kind of question. If I could ask you to go way back before you started writing, I would be curious what genres interested you before you discovered Japanese literature and translation? Did you have any favorite authors? Especially, did you enjoy any authors in translation before discovering Japanese authors in translation? Or did Japanese classic cinema influence you to go into Japanese literature in translation? <laughs> Oh, interesting questions. I'll start with the second question because it's an easy no. I have watched classic Japanese cinema, but not much. I used to watch movies a lot and I've stopped watching them. I don't know why. It's not a deliberate choice. I just feel like if it's a two hour commitment, I'd rather be spending that time like reading. I feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm mm -hmm. just very under read. And I think watching movies could, can be very instructive um, and inspirational sometimes. But but no, I, I would say my answer to that is probably no. But your other question was, before I encountered Japanese literature and translation, I have to say that I wasn't a reader when I grew up, when I was growing up. I was really involved in sports, and it, they took up all my time. It was a four-season sort of commitment. And, and I was also just a teenager rebelling in stupid ways and just I wasted a lot of time when I was younger now that I look back on that time in, of my life and um, I first encountered Japanese literature as a college student taking a course in, in Japanese studies that my college offered and I think the book was Kokoro and then we went from there to The Woman in the Dunes and those two books just blew my mind and it was happening at the same time that I was taking a Japanese arts class and a Japanese language class for the first time. And my mind was just being blown left and right. Just the world was just open up to me in ways that I had never imagined that it could. Um, just by encountering Japanese culture it was so different from anything that I, I was used to. And then shortly after that, I went to Japan and I was hooked, even though it took me a long time to 
move here and live and work here, I was always committed to the idea of coming to Japan. And in that 20 year sort of hiatus, I was reading about Japan constantly with the intention of, of getting here one way or another at some point. My answer to that question also is no, I didn't read much um, prior to just encountering Japanese literature for the first time. And it was only when I was 24 that I moved to Vietnam and lived in the countryside there. I don't know if I've mentioned this story here or not today. Stop me if I have. But I was really isolated and um, not from people in the community. I, it was one of the best years of my life, if not the best year of my life. It was a very formative year for me. Um, prior to that, I didn't really have a relationship to literature. Um, I, like I said, I wasn't a big reader, but once I was living in a place called Bienhua, I had no access to the internet. I had no TV, no radio, no access to newspapers or magazines, no phone. I had no letters that were sent to me were often never delivered or they were marked out, censored, or any news that was sent to me was ripped out. The government was just very afraid of me getting spreading news about the outside world. They wanted to control all the information that was coming in and going out of the country. I had no idea that the Oklahoma City bombing had happened. I don't think I was really aware of what had happened with the O.J. Simpson situation. I was really isolated. I had no contact with anyone in the outside world except for my parents when they called every other week to check up on me. Um, so during that time, it was a very intense time, and I. When I needed to retreat, which was often, I was one of only two foreigners in the whole province and the only American and the other foreigner, we never saw each other. So it was really just me. And I just poured myself into reading. I think because it was the most familiar thing to me. It was my way of connecting with English and the language and also with Western culture. And I just devoured books at that time. It was then that I became a reader. Where did, where did you get the books? I brought a lot of books with me because I was told to. <laughs> I was like, you're going to have a lot of time there. You should bring a lot. <laughs> but also in our training, a six-week training session that we had in Hanoi, I was given a lot of other books by people who were going home. And, and then I just picked up books elsewhere. But I just read and read and read. I've never read so much in my life. And I've never stopped. And it was then that I decided that I, I wanted to see if I could become a writer also. And it's just been a 30 year sort of journey since mm -hmm. then. But during that year, I was reading everything very eclectically, but mostly classics. And uh, I did bring some Japanese literature with me quite a bit. That year influenced my life in many ways. If I had been in a city, with all the distractions that cities always offer you, I probably would have just gone out on a motor scooter and just seen everything in the city every time, every moment that I had free. Whereas in the countryside, that wasn't a choice for me. And I just poured myself into books and it changed my life. So, Thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to know that somebody's still reading Somerset Morn. I was given that as a, um, a school prize about a few years ago, I think a book of his short story. So that's good to know that you're still reading that. Thank you. Um, I just wondered about the connection between um, the relationship, in your opinion, between uh, Vietnam and Japan in terms of literary interest or literary circles. Are, are Vietnamese people very interested in Japanese literature and vice versa? I think, yeah, that's a really good question. I, I appreciate you asking that. I think there's definitely interest in Vietnam and Japanese literature. I've been to readings of Japanese writers who've come to Vietnam, and I've sat in the audience, and they were very well attended. I have a friend who translates literature from Japanese into Vietnamese, and I guess he's a translation instructor at a university there. There are all kinds of Japanese language schools in Vietnam, and I think 
young people especially have a real affinity for Japanese culture. And I think that extends to literature as well. Although I think as with young people the world over, a lot of young people are interested in manga and anime and that kind of thing. But I do think that there's a demand for more classical, traditional literature. I don't know if that's the case in Japan, if it goes the other way or not. I, I believe that it does. But the, the thing is that the, there's so much more literature coming out of Japan than there is coming out of Vietnam, simply because Viet, Vietnam's government just controls everything that's published. And so you would expect there to be a lot more literature available to read in translation or even in Vietnamese coming out of Vietnam. But there's not because you don't have freedom of, of speech there. And writers have to be very careful in what they write and try to get published. And publishers have to be very wary. They almost always have to get their publications approved before they actually publish something. So <clears throat> I, I do wish there was more Vietnamese literature available in translation. I can't speak to the quality of the writing, but I think that the quality is very good. It's a very literate country and poetry is very important there. And there are still lots of people of any age who can recite poetry for you on the spot. And the most important book in their culture is The, the Tale of Q, um, which is an epic poem written in the early 19th century, which is well worth reading. There are a few translations in English anyway, that are excellent. And I'm sure there are excellent translations in, in French as well, since Vietnam was, a, was a, a colony of France at one point. I think there's a lot of interest though in, in Japanese culture and in Japanese literature in, in Vietnam, for sure. Do you have any insights on that yourself from your own experiences? Uh, no, I don't know much about Vietnam. I, I, did, I did do a Mekong River cruise um, through Laos. Oh, which, I was remembering that. That was rather wonderful. Hi, David. Yeah, I'm very nervous. I think it's the first time I've ever asked a question in this kind of situation. Would you ever write about a place that you have never visited yourself? Yeah, I don't see why not. I have done that to an extent in Burning Green Sun, where, which I read from earlier. That's not the Mekong Delta. The river is a real place, but I didn't have a particular place in mind where her research station is set up. That, that market that I described, it's not a specific market that I have in mind either. That those were all made up. When they go into Cambodia, there are places along the river that I know about, but um, I have imagined setting, I have imagined various settings for some of the scenes that I wrote there. Mm. Uh, they're mixed in with actual settings, uh, places that I visited and that I know about and that I'm also describing in the novel. If you're talking about just a made up town or even sci-fi, for example, I don't think I could do sci-fi. That's beyond me. I couldn't world build to that extent, I think. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, more, more like thinking of let's say your protagonist had to go to Kumamoto for a day. Would uh, you have to physically yourself go to Kumamoto to be able to think you could write write about it in to the level that you want to write about in your stories? Or would you be able to rely on books about Kumamoto or uh, web pages about it? Or, I, you know? I would definitely want to go there if I had the chance to. And I would feel very awkward about not going there if I were to write about it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's really important for me to have experience in the places that I'm writing about. And if it's a historical novel, then obviously historical Kumamoto versus contemporary modern Kumamoto, they're going to be very different places. Mm -hmm. I can't go back in time. Sure. But I could maybe find some old pictures or drawings or other people's accounts of living there or passing through or, or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um, and the internet is a great tool for that. If you mm -hmm. can't go to a certain place, if you can't visit a place, people often take videos of their trips to certain places right. and get a sense of what the landscape looks like. You might recognize some trees or flowers that are mm -hmm. in the background or something like that, how houses are lined up 
if a city is noisy or if it's quiet, there might be videos of Kumamoto where there's a festival going on and you can have a look at the festival and get a sense of kind of what that might be like. Yeah. So yeah. I wouldn't hesitate to do that necessarily, but I've never been in a situation where I was writing about a place generally where mm. I couldn't go somewhere and re sort of research it on my own before I were to write about it. It would be important for me to do that if I had the chance. I understand. Great. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, thank you for the question. And thank you for everything you've talked about so far. Oh, uh, my pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, all, all the uh, questions and, and discussion has been so interesting. But your interesting combination of Vietnam and Japan quite caught my fancy. And because I myself, in my 20s, visited Southeast Asia and was quite struck with the cultures of Indonesia and particularly Thailand was the one that I got to see. But and when I came to Japan, uh, the only reason I became so absorbed in Japan was opportunity because the Southeast Asian countries continued to be fascinating. And now I wonder if you find that your experience in Vietnam sensitized you to things in Japan that you might not have noticed or understood as well and feel some sort of very elemental affinity between the two countries that continue to fascinate you. I'm not sure how to answer that. Yeah. I spent time there and I've gotten deep enough into the cultures of the places that they just appealed to me on a very personal level. I've never had any bad experiences in, in either mm -hmm. country, I feel very safe in both countries. My intellect is very stimulated in, in both places. I find them to be very beautiful. I think there's a real wabi-sabi aesthetic to Vietnam. And you know, it's a very different experience to live in Japan as opposed to living in Vietnam. And especially going back 20 years ago. I don't know if there's something elemental th that I could think of I don't know. It just happened those two countries were part of your life. There wasn't any connection. I never intended to go to Vietnam in 1994. My, <laughs> I, I was working for the Asia Foundation in San Francisco straight out of college. And I was working for an organization called Partners for International Education and Training. And it was within the Asia Foundation. And about six months after I started working there, the Asia Foundation decided to get rid of our division. And so everybody was going to be without a job. But my supervisor at the time had been a volunteer teacher in Indonesia for two years. And she knew about this. She recommended that I apply to the same organization that had sent her to Indonesia because they had a new program that had opened up in Vietnam. And it was very difficult to get to Vietnam at that time. And she said, this would be an amazing time for you to, to Vietnam if you're interested. And in. I'll try. And so I applied and they accepted me and I went. But it was really a detour that lasted oh. <laughs> 20, about yeah 18 years or whatever it was, able to move to Japan. But I never intended to go there. But once I went there, I kept leaving and going back, leaving and going back. And Japan was always much more difficult for me to get to, basically because of the visa situations were so different. Ah, yeah. Vietnam, you would just go to a cafe and just say, hey, can you help me get a one-year visa? And they're like, ah. <laughs> Bring in $60 tomorrow and we'll get you a one-year visa. <laughs> it was that easy. You just go anywhere. <laughs> no problem. Just staying there. It's not that way anymore. But back then it was very easy to stay for as long as you wanted to. And it was very cheap. And you were actually working. You were teaching or something, right? Teaching there. I was writing for photos and things like that. And I was teaching online for the University of Maryland which was a great job for me to have there. And yeah, I just did whatever came up, but I had enough time because I wasn't spending all my time working the way that I was when I first came to Japan. I couldn't escape <laughs> these insane work weeks. But in Vietnam, I just worked as much as I needed to, as much as I wanted to. And the rest of the time I could spend researching, writing, reading, studying the language. It was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So while we're back to Vietnam, Jeremy's got a couple of Vietnam-related questions in the chat. 
So is there any prospect for your novels about Vietnam to be translated into Vietnamese or is that inconceivable? That's the first one. And then how's your Vietnamese compared to your Japanese? That's the next question. <laughs> so right now it's inconceivable uh, to get the stories translated. I have tried and they said that they would need to get the approval of the government before they would take on an actual translation. And it never came, the, the approval never came. So I assume that they didn't like the content of, of my novel, although I don't think there's anything particularly dangerous in it. But also my book won't be sold in bookstores there because bookstores also need to get government approval before selling foreign language books. And again, mine just never was approved for that. My Vietnamese language, it's been a long time since I've had an opportunity to use it, but my wife and I have found a wonderful Vietnamese restaurant in Komatsu that's about 40 or 45 minutes from here. And we go at least once a week, even though it's a long drive. It's a, there's a wonderful couple that runs the place. They're Vietnamese. Um, and I practice my Vietnamese with them whenever I can. And it's great because language acquisition for me always starts with food because I have to eat to survive. And so if I don't know a language, the first thing I l learn is how to order food and things like that. And so going to that restaurant brings me back to my roots in Vietnamese. My Japanese is now much better than, than my Vietnamese is. But at one point I was conversational. I was able to read newspapers and things like that. And I would really love to study Vietnamese again at some point. But I really need to focus on my Japanese and become really fluent. And I'm not there yet. Thank you for asking. Another question in the chat. I, I'm going to need some help here with pronouncing your name. Elahe? Yes, exactly. You're right. Ah! <laughs> so she asks, or do you want to ask your question yourself now that you're yeah, on I mean, speaking? Sorry, Go ahead. I wanted to ask about, in terms of sense of place, of course, there is fascination, but I feel that there are lots of times that there is frustration and the negative emotions that you experience from a place. How do you bring those negative emotions, if you have any, in your writing? And do you also want your characters and also your readers to feel that negative emotions and frustration? Or do you rather filter that out or avoid those negative emotions from a place? Yeah, thank you for that question. That's interesting. No, I don't think I avoid it at all. I don't think that my two Japanese novels particularly call for that necessarily within the story. I don't know that if there was a reason for me to have my characters express frustration or negativity with the local culture or something like that, I wouldn't have any problems putting that into the story. But if I consider it not furthering the plot, then I just won't include it in, in there. <clears throat> Even if I think it's realistic that the character would have those frustrations or those negative feelings, if I don't find a reason for it to be in the story, then I just won't include it. But I don't think I shy away. And in Lotus Land, the two main characters, Nathan and Anthony, Nathan really loves Vietnam. He tries very hard to integrate there and he wants to stay there. He embraces much of the culture. Whereas Anthony, his friend, who really becomes his antagonist, is the embodiment of all the frustration that most foreigners feel about Vietnam. And he would do anything to leave, but he's married into the culture. And he has a family there and he has a very successful business. So it's not easy for him to leave. Um, he's stuck there in a sense. And all of that negativity really comes out very strongly through him. The two characters balance each other off. They're pit against each other in terms of how they respond to being foreigners living in Vietnam in a culture that isn't their native cultures. Yeah, I, I wouldn't shy away from that at all if a book needs that. But that's a good, that's an interesting question. Now, of course, I would be careful also in terms of how I would show a character's negative feelings or frustration about a, a country. I wouldn't want to just tear a culture or a country apart. You'd want to be careful about that. And uh, you know, I don't feel that way about any foreign culture that I've ever encountered. So I would not be comfortable doing that, I don't think. But yeah, it's still fair to express frustration or 
negativity with certain things, but I wouldn't want to just tear down the people in their culture in my books. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, Svenja, over to you. Oh, good. Thanks. Another chance. Uh, I have a question about landscapes and what is more powerful for you when you experience a place, whether formal situations, you mentioned Kenokuen and Kanazawa, or um, informal, meaning more natural places like hiking trails stand out in your mind more. I feel a lot of power from Japanese preciseness of gardening. I love gardens, but also you've mentioned outlines of houses, how a, a town is defined by the, the way the houses line up or appear, et cetera. So I'm just curious in your sensitivity to uh, landscape, what do you think is more powerful? Do you like the more formal views? Do they stand out? Do they come back to you when you write your novels more? Or do you like hiking trails and just a sunset? <laughs> What's more powerful for you? Really interesting. Probably not a sunset and probably less the hiking trail because I think they're very hard to describe. You can't uniquely describe a sunset anymore, I feel. You can, but I don't think you want to mention it and move on, I think, for me. Whereas places like Kenrokuen, that's a more of a specific setting. And there are specific areas within Kenrokuen that I was focusing on in the novel, certainly in The Heron Catchers, which the first the opening chapter takes place in Kenrokuen, and the later chapter does too. It depends also on the placement of the landscape that I'm describing. If I need to do more than just describe the landscape just in passing if I need to lengthen it a bit so that I am able to develop a mood that I think that scene needs, then I'll spend more time with it. But I think probably specific settings rather than general landscape um, is easier for me to write about the sort of general landscapes are, are harder for me because it can be harder to just focus on one thing, the important thing. What am I looking at? If it's something very open, wide, it's hard to, to pinpoint certain things within that. It's interesting. I like doing both. I assume you're talking about Kanazawa when they go hiking up Hakusan Mountain. Um, I haven't so, gotten there yet. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. It's not a spoiler. It's just... But again, I'll visit all of these places. And if I find something within this wider landscape that I can focus on, then I'll do that. That's a very, that's always a nice discovery to find something that will give me a focus for this sort of open landscape or whatever. But talking about specific houses, some architectural details, for example, that for me is a lot easier to write about, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank and it you. gives you an opportunity to bring in unique details about a place, about a community or something. It didn't feel like a very articulate. No, I completely get it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, that, that question about sunsets may be a metaphorically good place to stop the official meeting. <laughs> and uh, if anyone wants to stick around and chat, we can do that. So let, let's all say thank you to David and I'll stop the recording and then we'll move into the, the Nijikai, as it were. David, thank you so much for, for sharing all of these things with us. It was a great pleasure. I appreciate it. And very instructive. Yeah, thank you.